I'd like to talk to you a little bit about tonight about an experiment in education in Charleston, South Carolina. I had nothing to do with the idea. Uh, I came in and put a business model together for a college that was put together by artists and educators. Most of you can figure either one of those probably doesn't do a very good business model, but when you put them together, it's worse. <laughs> That's our new building. That's the old streetcar barn in Charleston, South Carolina. That is our actually our third location. Uh, we've been in there four years now, and we are educating young American artists. How did it start? Hurricane Hugo. Some of you all remember Hurricane Hugo. Hurricane Hugo caused a lot of damage to the structures in Charleston. However, comma, more damage was probably done by the carpenters that showed up with a saw and a pickup truck <laughs> and started repairing the historic structure. And so the powers to be decided maybe we ought to do something about this because, as you know, in the United States, skilled craftsmen started dying with the Industrial Revolution. And the 20th century people like Philip Simmons that you've heard about in Charleston, the people that did the work in the 20th century were dying out. If you take it back a step, Charleston had the worst earthquake east of the Mississippi River in 1886. Those houses in Charleston, mainly the masonry ones, still have earthquake issues because of bad repairs that were done you know, subsequent to the earthquake. Uh, they lost a house on Buffane Street a couple years ago, mainly because of bad mortar and those kinds of things. Now, that one had a fire and then water got in there and hurricane, you know, one of the hurricanes came by and eventually they, they, the people were in there trying to repair it. And they heard stuff start cracking, they got out of there and they had to tear that. And it was a beautiful house. But nobody is training young men and women in the United States how to repair these things. Now, you people live in wonderful houses here, so I don't want you to think the school was started because of preservation, but classic techniques can be used in quality new construction, and, and, and as many of our graduates are doing quality new construction as they actually are, as, as they're doing renovation work. So it's not just about fixing old houses. Uh, if you want quality timber framing, if you want quality ironwork, if you want quality plaster, those kinds of things work in quality new construction as well. So, it took them a while to figure out how to do it. They studied a French 10-year system of training artisans that's about 900 years old. Well, American families don't understand 10 years in a college context, so they truncated that into four years with the hands-on portion and added an academic curriculum that supports the construction business. So you, our math is the trigonometry and the algebra and the geometry that it takes for building. Our science is, is uh, material science and mainly about why the materials fail. Mainly it's water. But, and the people that teach that particular class work on the Hunley work on, uh, they work for Metters Industries, and they do it every day, so our professors deal in these kinds of things. Our history is architectural history. Of course, the accreditors say you've got to teach U.S. history, but if you're teaching architectural history, you start back basically at the Stone Age and you work forward, and you talk about all, you know, all the reasons for change, and you learn all the other history anyhow just by studying the built environment and how it all works. Obviously, we teach English. Obviously, we teach a foreign language. And, of course, nowadays, right now, if we're small, we only teach Spanish. Who are most of the work workers uh, that the, the young men and women have to work with? Uh, we teach in the upper, you know, the junior, senior classes. They get construction management, building management, accounting so that they can run a business. We're not teaching them how to be an accountant, but they need to make sure they understand that their accountant is doing a good job for them. Uh, leadership, those kinds of things. Every student takes two semesters of hands-on drawing and drafting. If you study Michelangelo, he was complaining because he wanted to get out of the drawing and go to work on the stone. They made him do it about 10 years. If you read the 
Storm and the Fury or whatever. And they, they had a movie about that, but that's only the last years of it. If you actually read the book, they made him study drawing until he was ready to walk away from all of it. Because if you can't draw it, you probably can't create it. And so, yes, we have computers. Yes, we teach CAD. Yes, we teach Rivet for you know the advanced construction kinds of things. Yes, we have power tools, but they all start with saws, chisels, hammers, that, and then and then because you're going to have and you know forge welding and those kinds of things. So, classical <coughs> techniques designed to support both preservation and quality new construction. Uh, where we are different than anybody else is that education piece. You can go learn some of these bits and pieces in other schools. No, you can't go get a Bachelor of Applied Science in most of them. And the critical aspect of thinking that goes with the liberal arts that we who are a little bit older in this room understand liberal arts and what liberal arts used to be, that's what we still do. And so we teach that critical thinking and how it supports what they're going to need to do to be successful. Again, this is, if you've been to Edmund Oast in Charleston, you know, you know where it is. That's some of the work of our graduates and our students. Uh, some people call that the chapel of beer. Uh, so you can take quality, you know, medieval timber framing and you can do other things with it. But we built that for them. If you've been to Drayton Hall, Drayton Hall recently, we built the timber frame, super, the structure that supports the new uh, welcome center and little museum and the stuff that they have there. That's classical timber framing done to support a new building. So we, you know, we put the education together about what's appropriate, why is it appropriate, and how it fits into the environment that, you know, that we want to support, we want to have a better built environment. I happened to be in Paris that, that, that night. Our son ran the marathon. That was on a Tuesday, I think. He had run the marathon on Sunday, and we were going to, a, going to dinner that night when that happened. And it was, we went to the same restaurant that our son and his wife got engaged. I didn't know all of that at the time, but they were they had gotten engaged in Paris. Uh, and so this is a perfect example of why we need people that are skilled to do that. We actually had a graduate from last year, a year and a half ago now, that was at a fellowship in France he did some analysis of their ironwork about, you know, after the damage of the fire. The, the government wanted him to come back. Of course, the government, both of them, messed up the visas, and he's back in Charleston now. But, I mean, here's a guy one year out of school, not even a year out of school, and he's working on, you know, a disaster in one of the finest, you know, most well-known buildings in the world. We have had, the United States has been trying since the 30s to send people to this fellowship. It got sort of re-energized about 10 years ago. We've had four students, they have to be under 30, best artisans in the world. The Americans have sent about 10 people, four of them have been our graduates that have gone to this. That's the level that they lead the school with, and that's the kind of work that people ask them to do. So we're, our product has proven itself, uh, and, and, and again, if you actually went to look at it the next morning, you wouldn't have known there was much of a fire there, uh, but you couldn't see it, you know, from, you know, from the street level. Uh, I told you about the building. Mayor Riley wanted us to get that building. We renovated that building. We had had some other locations before that. Uh, that first slide was us. We are in the old streetcar bar on Meeting Street, uh, and it was built to support what we do uh, as, as a college. These are the kinds of things that a lot of schools can't tell you that we do, okay? Uh, a student faculty ratio of about 8 to 1. We can't teach what we do in big classes. We don't have an auditorium. We don't, you know, we don't have a math class with 200 people. 
You know, the math class tends to be bigger than the shop classes, but I mean, the biggest class we have is about 25 people. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it, it's a small scale, hands-on, everybody knows everybody in the school. Uh, this is down a little bit. Uh, we had last year uh, a woman got an associate degree with us, retired captain, co-star, uh, PhD from Oxford University, and she came with us to learn plaster for two years. So that kind of bumped it up. A little bit. Uh, this is current. The farthest we've had is. Uh, Wasilla, Alaska. You may remember that town. You can see Russia from there. <laughs> we have a picture of that student. He worked at the U.S. Capitol on the dome. You may remember a few years ago when it was wrapped up. Our students have to do an externship, and I got a slide on that, but I'll tell you the story now. Every summer that they're with us, they have to go out and work with industry. First of all, you can't learn everything in the classroom, so they got to go out and do it for real. In this particular case, Washington, D.C., bureaucracy, labor unions, and then the, and the union guys are going, you're making us look bad. Tear that back out. <laughs> no, you, 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 do it again. Uh, so, I mean, you learn the real world stuff. But that's what was going on. Don't work too fast in here. You know, we're getting paid by an hour, here, not by the job. Uh, okay. What do we teach? And I'll show you some slides in a minute. The only school in the United States at the undergraduate level teaching classical architecture and design. Uh, we added that major, uh, that excuse me, specialization. You know, remember the accreditors. Uh, that specialization a year ago, so we're a year and a half into that one. In the Charleston tradition of forged ironwork, not cast iron like New Orleans, but classical 16th, 17th, 18th century French, primarily some English uh, forged iron. The difference in the 20th century and the Philip Simmons that the people from Charleston know about, Philip Simmons was self-educated because we didn't have a school like that then. He taught himself. His stuff was you know, electrically welded. That stuff fails. Where the joints are in a well is where you're going to have problems because it holds moisture and it's going to rust out. Forged iron, you take two pieces of iron, you put them together, you know, on an anvil, and it becomes one piece, you don't have that problem. Hmm. So uh, if you go look at the, at the good iron work around the Lutheran <coughs> Church or St. Philip's or Gibbs Art Gallery or those things in Charleston, that's all 19th century, primarily German workers in those days. <coughs> Uh, forged iron as opposed to the Philip Simmons work in the 20th century. We are repairing a lot of Philip Simmons iron work. He was the inspirational founder of the college, came to the graduation until he died. Not criticizing what he did, but he had nobody to teach him. He taught himself. So he And he wondered who was going to replace him until we put that school together. And for you women in the crowd to do needlepoint, the first thing he would do when a student would give him a piece of ironwork is he'd turn it over to the back to look at the back of it. So uh, and he, we, he came to our graduations. That's a fairly popular uh, 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 specialization. We got problems in masonry, plaster, stone carving because young men and women in America don't understand anything about plaster, very little about stone carving, and really don't care to work much in masonry. What do those numbers mean on top? Of that's uh, that's what came in here uh, this past this this current year. Okay. Okay. Those that, that that's kind of shows you who came in this year, what they're taking. We do very well in wood. They can watch barn builders, you know, Amish this, uh, forged by fire, all those things on the TV. Who's doing a show on plaster work? Nobody. So they don't know about it. We get a call from the architect of the U.S. Capitol on a regular basis looking for plasters. The U.S. Capitol, he runs the Capitol, the Supreme Court, part of the Smithsonian, and a couple of those other important buildings. His workforce is aging out. He can't replace them. And we, and we have trouble drawing young men and women to study that because they don't know anything about it. So we, we're doing everything we can to help him and, and the other people. But, you know, those... The qualities of plaster work, those of you that have, you know, it's quieter, it doesn't burn, it can get wet, all of those things as opposed to sheetrock, uh, people in the United States don't know about that anymore, so we're having a challenge there. 
the two wood trades or timber framing in the classical Renaissance, you know, uh, later half timber houses in England, Fockwerk houses in Germany, uh, in the Alsace, those kinds of things. And you saw the picture a while ago of you know how you can use that in, even in a modern kind of sense. But those are the specializations that we do. Again, we are trying to find young men and women to just, you know to take the plaster and, and masonry courses. The first one we got, we have a number of veterans there, so they can use their benefits. That happened earlier. Finally, let me tell you, accreditation in the United States is a difficult process if you're a new school and if you do different things than all the other schools. They don't understand a school that does things like we do. Uh, and primarily it has nothing to do with education. It's basically based around finances. So uh, we have an issue nationally with accreditation and what they do. That stuff came in after World War II to watch the GI Bill and they don't particularly care about what you do in education just as long as you know, you're financially straight then you know, they'll kind of approve you. So it took us a while to do that. We offer two degrees, a two-year associate and a four-year Bachelor of Applied Science. Uh, those are the degrees that the, South, that the state of South Carolina gave us. Okay, who else can say this in the United States? Okay, you saw the paper today, if you get the Charleston paper, you know, USC is not going to raise in-state tuition, but if you read the rest of the story, they're raising the out-of-state tuition. But the issue with these colleges, ladies and gentlemen, is not about the tuition, it's about the bureaucracy and, the, and, the, and, the, and everything that these schools have put themselves into place. It, I came in there and I said, we don't need to raise tuition, we've got to cut some costs. So those of you that are paying for your grandchildren to go to school, uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that raise. When I went to the Senator, we were talking about that a while ago, there was one vice president. They got a platoon of vice presidents. So, <laughs> so uh, and you say, how much is it? It's $20,000 a year. Now, on top of that, about $300 a semester of shop fees, so that I, that I got wood or iron or whatever in front of them. But, you know, that tuition hasn't changed. That's not the answer. And if you look at uh, former governor of Indiana, took over Purdue, he did the same thing. He's quit raising. He's quit raising. If you follow it in the Wall Street Journal, you'll see that, that that stuff is a hoax. Some people are paying that tuition, but other people are getting all these write downs. And so there, there's there's some creative financing there. Uh, average student debt is somewhere between ten and twelve thousand, depending on the year. Ten, twelve thousand dollars a year after four years leaving with us. That's a lot of money, but that's not a lot of money if you've been following that stuff. And so we feel pretty good about that. I mean, wishing we were nothing, but the American family with 2008 recession, all that, none of them saved any money, and they all figured that government loans were, you know, were the answer. Well, government loans can cost you, and the government, ladies and gentlemen, will give you money for anything. You need a car, you need a house, you need this. You can take those student loans, but we tell our kids you don't have to pay that back. So uh, that's, that's a national problem. For those grandparents in here, our kids are not waiting tables on King Street in Charleston. <laughs> we have to do for accreditation a third party verification that our students are working in the skills that they studied with us. Actually, the number was 30 out of 30. They don't count two of them because they were continuing their education in Ireland and England. But these, these 28 kids were working in the fields that they studied with us. And so that, our accreditation agencies interested in that. A lot of schools and, and accreditation agencies aren't. We obviously are. If you're going to come to school, you're going to learn a trade or a skill. You know, if you're going to study to be an accountant, you might, have, you, you might want to be an accountant. But... You need to pick a major where you can actually get work, and these kids, you know, there is work for these young men and women to study with us. We added this art, uh, classical architecture and design. That's one of the specializations, and I think we got five or six young uh, people in there studying classically trained architectural methods to include how the stuff works because we're right there. They can go talk to the timber framers. They can go talk to the masons. They're in the building as they're designing stuff because most architects don't have a clue 
about how a building comes together. You know, nowadays they're drawing a glass box or this or that, whether it works or not as a material, they've done something that, you know, that looks right on paper, it's not always right. So we're trying to do something a little bit different. Uh, but it, the old way of training architects, which originally meant they were actually involved in the building process and supervising, not what we know today. Again, the Charleston uh, Forged Iron, she's at the fellowship now. Uh, in Paris, uh, outside Paris, he went last year. That's the guy that was at Notre Dame uh, last year, assessing the damage to their ironwork. Uh, that, those of you that know the South Carolina Society Hall on Meeting Street, that is his senior. Pro Everybody has to do a capstone project. That was his. That's a copy of the lamps that are on the staircases there at Society Hall in Charleston. And mm -hmm. the iron instructors say that's the best piece of ironwork we produced at the college to date. Beautiful. Again, carpentry and timber framing, and I showed you the picture earlier. Uh, you know, again, classic. Yes, we have power tools. Yes, we know how to use them, but they start with the hand tools. This is a piece of the stained glass window that's now up in the library. Uh, the students carved that over a number of years, put that in. Some other students created the stained glass. That's Mike Lauer I talked about a few minutes ago, I think. Uh, he came to us with a, PA, with a master's degree, he was doing IT work in Chicago, saying the stuff doesn't last, I want to do something that's lasting. He's got a very good plaster company. In fact, he's teaching for us right now. We talked a little bit about externships. Again, these students are going to some great places, working for some wonderful people. We had Stratford Hall into the school on Sunday night, now they want somebody every summer there. We got somebody at Mount Vernon every year, uh, Colonial Williamsburg, Lincoln Cathedral, uh, to include Fort Sumter, other places. So they're working on some, you know, world-class structures in addition to learning, you know, working with industry. Talked about capstone a minute ago. Every student has to do a masterpiece before they graduate. That's a senior, that takes an entire senior year. First semester is coming up with an idea, resourcing it. And then in the second semester, they create it. Back in the stone shop yesterday, this week, I saw a beautiful finial. The National Cathedral sent a finial down. The student thinks he's going to carve that one of those finials between now and the end of the school year. <coughs> We're not sure he's going to get it done, but by God, he's trying. So, this is a timber frame table in, you know, furniture quality. That's in our boardroom now, the size to go in there. But, I mean, that's just an example of the kind of work that they do when, before they leave us. We get involved in the community. That's a bus stop and a bench that we did uh, last year, uh, a little bit up the peninsula because, you know, the... A lot of the bus stops don't have covers, most of them don't have benches, so you know we you know we gotta build stuff. I want it to actually go somewhere. Uh, to go out to Edisto Island, Geechee Boyd Grits, the two students, the Patricia Willis there uh, is one of the females that's over in the fellowship this year, but they've designed and built that timber frame structure. If you go by Geechee Boyd Grits, that's that those two students built that for their capsule project last year. Again, I talked about Drayton Hall. That's all classical timber framing. Circular Congregational Church there on Meaning Street. We've been working with the preservation folks for about the last, it's either two or three years with some grants, teaching people how to maintain these cemeteries. 25 years ago, everybody said you got to fix the gravestones with epoxy. Well, guess what, guys? That, that has a shelf life at about 25 years. So you got to go back to the classical techniques. We're repairing these old graves. We're teaching other churches how to do it. And so it's, you know, not only are we learning, but we're actually helping other people learn. There's a funny story here. We all know Christopher Gadsden, Don't Tread on Me. Uh, Philip Simmons made those gates. Those gates were in terrible shape about six, seven years ago. We restored those gates, put them back up at, the, at that house. It's now an event space. The next day, somebody with a lawnmower trailer garden guy went through and tore up one of the gates. We had to do it again. So, uh, but you know, this is after we had restored those and put them back on that place. And so we get involved in real projects. We didn't do that when I came to school. I didn't want to waste the materials doing stuff that looks good standing in our lobby but doesn't fit anything when I got to buy the material. 
Uh, we documented this house, Hutchison House on Ernesto Island. We told them they ought to cover that up until they get the money to restore. That's a Freeman's cottage. <clears throat> Some of you may know the story that that belongs to the Ernesto Island Land Trust now. Uh, we did a lot of work out there, and we will do some more work once they get the money to do the work. But thank God they put that cover over because that was right before the last big hurricane that went through. Uh, we're in the process of building a, a you know a good library, uh, visual arts, uh, decorative arts, fine arts, building arts. This is our Daughters of the American Revolution uh, special collections where the old books are. <coughs> These are Thomas Jefferson designed book boxes in which he sent his books to the Library of Congress after the British burned the first Library of Congress in 1813 or 14, whatever that was, at the War of 1812. And so uh, the DAR helps us with some of this. They help us when we were in jail, protect our books. And we've asked them for a grant to see if we can get some money to buy some of the books that Thomas Jefferson, architectural books that he sent to the Library of Congress. We actually had a gentleman in there the other night that's going to donate one of those books, a period book to us. So our kids ought to see those classic books and we're working to build a unique library designed around what we do with period, uh, you know, folio volumes. This window is up in the new architecture room. It was a computer lab. The students, how does, you know, we talked about a while ago, the math, we couldn't get up to that when we bought the building. It was up, way up in the eave. They measured it, you know, arithmetically from the ground. They didn't carve for about, even before we owned the building, started carving the stone, did it over three years. Those are dogwood flowers and jasmine flowers for South Carolina. Uh, and then other students created that glass. Uh, so we had wood students, iron students, stone students involved in that. We've that's been in the building now a year and a half. Uh, the most important part is at the initial graduation, Joe Riley, the mayor, uh, was the speaker, and he said, you know, people are going to think that eventually, with Charleston involved in architecture, you're going to think this school was there forever. It wasn't. It's difficult to build a new school in the United States, not only just to build a new school, but with the educational bureaucracy as such as it is. So he, people are going to think it was always there. It wasn't. But he then said that the college is Charleston's gift to America. Mm -hmm. We believe that. I'm going to tell you, if, they, if you had the students here, and I know you all met a bunch of them, they are great Americans. They can do anything. Uh, with us, they have to go to class. With us, they have to turn in their work. Uh, you can't skip class and graduate with us. I mean, you, we fail people. Uh, we don't have social promotions. All of the issues that many of you read about in the paper with American education, the people that put that school together have addressed those issues. We don't have tenure. So uh, I didn't come up with those ideas. I did the business model, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to be there every day and have fun watching these students grow. I mean, they take row every day. Okay. Uh, I know I'm standing between you and supper, <laughs> but for dinner. But what I will do is I will answer any further questions. There are some brochures in the back. Next week, uh, a couple, four years ago, the board told me I had to come up with honoring some great preservationists. The first year we did Dick Moe, who was the head of the National Trust for a long time, and then he recommended a woman, Nancy Campbell, whose husband was in charge of Colonial Williamsburg. She raised half a billion dollars for the National Trust as a volunteer. <laughs> then was involved in uh, redoing Madison's house there in Virginia as the head of that board as a volunteer. Last year we did Mayor Riley, and this year, you know this guy, Bob Vila, Oh, no. uh, cool. <laughs> Bob Vila is coming to be with us next week. If you want to have dinner with Bob Vila, there are actually some invitations back there. Uh, but that's our fundraiser for scholarships. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you, I met him last year uh, in Florida. Brilliant guy. He really didn't know a lot about what was going on in those houses, but he hired a crew that knew how to do them. Uh, and he's gone on to write a bunch of books and other things. But uh, you, you can't. Help but say that guy really had a lot to do nationally with, with you know, 
saving a lot of these old houses. You can argue whether renovation is the right thing or this or that or the other, but he saved a lot of wonderful structures and got a whole generation of Americans to understand that, so we're going to honor him next week. Any questions? And subsequent to that, Ann and I have gotten to know Colby better, know the facility better, know the students better, and I tell you, this guy has served our country for decades, but since 2008, when he joined as the president of this business with no pay, he mm -hmm. has served our country again for another decade. Mm -hmm.